is going on, everyone? Welcome to CFB Pod. I'm Dave Shoemate from Mock 10 Sports. Don't forget to subscribe to us on Twitter. Uh, this is all college football, only college football season, uh, only college football show. Apologize. All off season, throughout the season, we're going to have a ton of good content for you here. Me, Blake Gilmer, to a couple other guys, just phenomenal group that do a phenomenal job of just co- covering college football. Uh, give me a follow at Mock 10 Sports if you get a second. But I just want to go into what should be expectations or what should the expectations be for Mike Elko in year one at Texas A&M? Mike Elko, the new man in College Station after a successful two-year stint at Duke where he accumulated a 16-9 and record with two bowl appearances. The talent's there, guys. We know that. With Jimbo Fisher, we'll talk about it in a minute, kind of putting Texas A&M recruiting on the map a little bit. So he kind of gave them a national recognition. Um, the recruiting classes have accumulated. There's some talent there. I know they've entered a portal there, but the talent isn't bare. They brought in some winnable to winnable plus guys out of the portal during the December signing period. I'm going to say winnable to winnable plus. That's how we used to grade guys at places I was. A winnable player just for Texas A&M fans to realize would be like a going back to the 2018 Texas A&M off the line when I was there. A winnable player would be like Carson Green. A winnable plus player would be Eric McCoy. A winnable player is you can win with him, but you need to have someone else with him. Like to bring him along a little bit like a tr- like he's a trailer. He's got to get pulled along by somebody. Eric McCoy's a winnable plus, more of a truck. He's going to bring you along with him. You need Eric McCoy. They're difference makers, but you also need winnable guys, too, because you're not going to have winnable plus guys across the board. But I think they brought in a good combination of those guys in the early December transfer portal. And Texas A&M isn't waiting around to use this as a rebuilding year. As you often hear new coaches say all the time, especially in their opening press conferences, I mean, they brought in 22 portal additions so far. And we still have a spring cycle. But just some guys to highlight. Remember, 22 transfer portal additions leading off with Kansas State corner Will Lee, Youngstown State linebacker Alex Howard, Louisiana Tech wide receiver Cyrus Allen I've heard good things about. They've loaded up on some tight ends. They brought in two Purdue tight end Garrett Miller, uh, we'll get to the next one here in a minute. Vanderbilt safety to Ricky Wright, a little bit more of a potential inside-the-box guy. Uh, he was a cover guy for Vanderbilt, but would get a little exposed. I think he's better when he's inside the box. Bigger safety, uh, he's helping that depth inside the box at the inside linebacker position as well. Purdue edge, Nick Scorton, another uh, – he's a local kid, ended up going to Purdue, had a phenomenal season at Purdue. Florida linebacker Scooby Williams, again, adding to that inside depth. Bowling Green Edge, Cassius Howe. I remember him out of Kansas City. Edge guy led the MAC in sacks. So you're seeing all different kind of levels of kids they're bringing in. The Power Four, Group of Five, FCS. I mentioned the other tight end, Fresno State tight end, Trey Watson. And they even brought in some younger uh, freshmen from this past year. Uh, guys like Des Ricks, who did a really good job for Alabama uh, or should, should say was the next man up at Alabama, but they got him at Texas A&M now. So those are some names to remember uh, when looking at these 2022, these 22 additions from the transfer portal. Again, eight defensive backs, five linebackers, if you include the edge guys, just throwing them in there for keepsake. And if you're including, like I said, the Ricky Wright, the Vanderbilt safety transfer, he's more of an in-the-box safety to me. They brought in two tight ends. We talked about three offensive linemen for depth. So a lot of additions, and I'm sure – they will get through their 15 spring practices, reevaluate, reevaluate the roster like they should, like any other good team would do, and get back into the portal market when the spring window opens. Now, I worked at Texas A&M in 2018, assistant director of player personnel, Jimbo Fisher's first year. Mike Elko was in his first year at Texas A&M this year. Coming over from Notre Dame, he was the defensive coordinator, so I'm very familiar, aware of Mike Elko. I worked with him, enjoyed working with him. Intense, smart, organized, has a plan, but – I think anybody who'd worked with him would be lying to you if they didn't say relatability would be maybe a little bit of an issue for him. Uh, very similar to Lane Kiffin's portal approach because he doesn't like to play the long game of recruiting the high school prospect. And I get that. If you're not really, hey, man, I got to be on the phone with this kid every night, especially if he's like an out-of-state kid. Hey, I saw you got your big in-state offer. Are you still going to stick with us? Stuff like that. It's a long game there. Transfer portal I mean, it long is 30 days technically. Probably should be a little shorter than that if I'm going to be honest. Cut to two 
two weeks, really, because I mean, it takes 30 days to make a decision. It's a conversation for another day, but very similar, but different Lane Kiffin and Mike Elko, very transact, very, very transactional process, which can be great in today's time, but I don't think you can go as heavy in the portal at o, at A&M as you can at Ole Miss because of such a historical lineage football state, the state of Texas is, um, and how involved the high school coaches are there. I think it's a little different. And I'm not saying he's implementing that strategy. I haven't even heard that. I'm just saying. But it seems like they will use their salary pool on proven transfers, which is awesome at all levels, as you saw. when I was naming off some of those names. And we're getting power four level, um, group of five, FCS, some big-time freshmen that didn't play at bigger schools last year that they brought in. But I think they're also going to be into the retention. Guys that have proven they're going to try to play uh, – some guys that have proven that can play, they're probably going to give some of that money to them. They're going to try to out-evaluate some people through the high school ranks. But to this season specifically, again, what are real, honest, true expectations for Mike Elko in year one at Texas A&M? I want to go over a few things I like about Texas A&M as well as bring up some concerns I have with the Aggies as well heading into the 2024 season as of today. Things I like. There's some familiarity to the program from his time being the defensive coordinator from 2018 to 2021. That's four seasons. It's a lot, so, especially in today's time. Elko, he had a bird's eye view. But first, let's get this out of the way. Jimbo, I brought it up a little bit earlier. Jimbo Fisher wasn't just a total disaster, and the program wasn't just a total dumpster fire either. Jimbo raised the ceiling for Texas A&M in recruiting, in my opinion. And recruiting was in the middle of kind of an error change during Jimbo's tenure, and he made them a national brand due to his resume. Um, A&M was recruiting nationally. I mean, getting kids out in California, Arizona. P Jimbo Fisher's resume and his big contract kind of put them like, oh, shoot, Jimbo Fisher won a national championship in 2013 with Florida State, Jameis Winston, and all those guys. Like, I'm going to at least go try it out. They get there. The facilities are real nice. The networking is unbelievable there. So I think Jimbo Fisher helped elevate that. I think Kevin Sumlin helped a little bit, obviously Johnny Manziel. But Jimbo Fisher helped take it to the next level of the new era recruiting. So I just wanted to acknowledge that. just wanted to acknowledge that because all isn't bad in College Station from that standpoint, from a personnel roster standpoint. But obviously Jimbo had his faults from an organization CEO standpoint. I think he lacked in that. And that's coming from somebody who sat in the building. And I think – Elko at least, Mike Elko at least have some answers to the test as he enters his first season. He isn't walking into this blind or blindfolded. He knows what he's getting into. Again, he's had a bird's eye view sitting there in those staff meetings. So we'll get into some more here in a minute. But again, not walking in blind, uh, blind to this, but he's somewhat of an introvert. But he talks, you'd be surprised at how many true media members out there. That's big in the state of Texas, especially with Tex Ags, Billy Lucci, and the brother. Got to kind of. Be aware of those guys. And he's talked to quite a few of the big people, big donors at Texas A&M as well, because he already had a previous relationship there during his four years previously as the defensive coordinator. So he has a head start over anyone else who potentially could have got that job at Texas A&M back in November. So, again, there's some natural familiarity with the people around the program and the roster. And I keep saying it. And here's the other point. The Aggies have a relatively, relatively speaking, SEC schedule. It's manageable. It's manageable. A lot of toss-ups. Let me pull it up. Uh, let's pull it up right here. Share the screen. So here you go. Open it up with Notre Dame on August 31st. That'll be a big one. Big one at Kyle Field. Again, I think this is kind of a toss-up game to me. Not saying they're going to win or lose. I mean, there's a lot of question marks for both teams there. McNeese State, you should get a win there. At Florida, how will Florida be? They got an opening game against Miami. What will be their attitude coming in? It's going to be a big game. It's first conference game for both teams. Billy Napier is going to need that one. He doesn't want to lose to a first-year head coach in Mike Elko at home. So Florida is going to be kind of rolling in with some confidence there. Eh, we'll see. I think that's kind of a toss-up. I think they should get Bowling Green. I think they should get Arkansas and Arlington. Missouri, I think that's a toss-up at home. At Mississippi State's one, I think they should get, if they want to get into that 8-9 win total. LSU at home, a toss-up. I think at South Carolina is a toss-up. If it was at Kyle Field, I would think that would lean towards Texas A&M, and I wouldn't really count it more as a toss-up. But it's a road game in the SEC. Uh, I'm going to count that as a potential toss-up. New Mexico State, hey, sitting in Auburn again. But New Mexico State lost some of those guys. This should be a win for Mike Elko in his first year. Let's be honest. We're going to call that a win. Then at Auburn, massive trap game, look-ahead game, because you see what's next. The next week, 
whoever scheduled this, if I'm looking at it, if, if I was Ross Bjork, I guess not anymore when he went to Ohio State. But if I'm Mike Elko and I looked at that when I took the job, I'm like, dang, that's a long way away. But at Auburn, one of the tougher places to play in the league, should be improved. I know they got Alabama the next week, Auburn, so they could be looking ahead too. But Texas Tech State is probably the biggest SEC game of the season because of the rivalry and how long they played. What was it? 2011 was the last time they played. Justin Tucker, the game went in field goal. We see what he's done this. That's how long it's been. But that's a major look ahead game at Auburn. That's tough for probably the biggest game in your program's last, what, 11, 12 years? So I think you got a lot of toss ups. I mean, I'm going to go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. The positive thing, though, and we'll come back to this, is five of those seven toss ups are at the home confines of Kyle Field. So that's big. That's big if you're Mike Elko from that standpoint. But, again, I think that schedule is manageable. There's not a lot of for-sure losses on there. For right now, I'd really just probably say that Texas law is a, is a loss. That Texas game, maybe even Auburn. I just hate when that game's on the schedule. If that game was anywhere else, I would say that. But, again, I think there's about seven toss-ups there with five of them coming at home. I think that's, I think that's doable. But concerns, I told you I mentioned roster familiarity and a manageable schedule relative to the SEC are some things I like heading. Uh, I like for Texas A&M heading into 2024. The concerns, you know, there's going to be them. My initial one, jumping off, new offensive coordinator Colin Klein coming over for Kansas State. How does quarterback Connor Wiegman fit into that system? I don't think he does right off the bat. Doesn't mean they can't have a productive offense. I just don't think he does. Klein's offense differs from that of what Jimbo Fisher was. And I know Jimbo Fisher was so high on Connor Wigman. Talking to his people in the program, they're, they want to see him step up a little bit more as a leader. Can he mature over this offseason? Maybe in having a guy closer to his age a little bit, not big time, but Colin Klein, a younger guy who had college football success playing quarterback at Kansas State himself. Maybe that helps him grow as a leader. But the Wildcats specifically, Klein's offense, ran multiple formations, primarily relied on mobility from their quarterback position with players such as Adrian Martinez, Will Howard, who transferred over to Ohio State, and Avery Johnson. I mean, it looks like Avery Johnson is going to be that dude for me in the future. But none of those quarterbacks, none of those three quarterbacks between Adrian Martinez, Will Howard, and Avery Johnson have similar styles of play as Connor Wigman. They just don't. They just don't. It's a run-heavy offense during Klein's, during Klein's tenure with Chris Kleiman in Manhattan. Klein led the offense to back-to-back top 40 scoring offenses and top 15 rushing totals. Last season, the Wildcats averaged over 445 yards and 37.8 points per game. Uh, now, as we all know, the best coaches tweak their core, their like, core system to their personnel at times. I mean, at Kansas State, he had Deuce Vaughn, who was a uh, do-everything running back for him his four years there, and good running threat along with Will Howard, who I think did a lot of his damage on the ground. Now, let's be honest. Kansas State is never going to be loaded on the outside at wide receiver. They're just the recruiting blueprint for Kansas State. They're not going to be loaded with guys out on the edge offensively and can go make plays. I mean, they may have one guy, but they're not. So you've got to build your system around that. And Colin Klein was used to that with Bill Snyder when he played. But Colin Klein will have the most talented wide receiver group he has had at his dis- disposal starting this season. I mean, can Moose Muhammad kind of get it turned around? Good player when he's got his head on right. I mean, Jedi Walker, I mean, they got some guys. That, but again, May not be one of the best in the SEC, but it's the best Colin Klein, I think, has had. Uh, now, Klein will also receive, I think, some good ideas from co-OC wide receiver coach Holloman Wiggins, offensive line coach Adam Cushing, who was with Duke OC Kevin Johns, and they had a good offense. So I think there, there's going to be some ideas thrown against the wall. I think this is going to be more of a committee approach. Klein will call it, but I think he's going to be open. For everybody I know it knows Colin Klein. Great guy, open to ideas. So I could see that being fine. But I think it's just a question mark. How does Connor Wigman fit into that system? Remember, the great coaches fit their personnel. They tweak their system a little bit to the strengths of their personnel. I always thought Dan Mullen did a really good job with his quarterbacks at uh, Mississippi State, specifically in Florida, uh, to play towards their strengths. He, he adjusted that system. Now, my other concern, I'm not overly sold on Jay Bateman at the defensive coordinator position. But I know Mike Elko will be involved – on the defense, so I know it's going to be solid. And he's going to out-scheme some guys, Elko, because that's what Mike Elko does. But if truly Jay Bateman's calling it, it's a little bit of concern. If Mike Elko takes that true CEO head coach approach, he's dealing more of the NIL stuff, which I heard he had an early start to that. He was dealing with, like, he was negotiating the contracts, which I think is a little well, it's wild. The head coach at Texas A&M is uh, working the phones 
ironing out the contract. You probably need to have someone else with you there, but that's a conversation for another day. But if Elko's involved, expect a lot of simulated pressures and zone blitzes. If you've ever listened to a Mike Elko clinic or been around him, he's very vocal and honest about his style, very strategic in his play calling, and even is willing to concede first downs at times. He says, I mean, if I give up eight yards on first down, it's second and one, second and two. They're like, we'll just back up. We'll, we'll concede. We don't want to give up the deep shot because second and one, second and two, offensive coordinator can pull out anything he wants out of his bag. He could go take a deep shot on you because he's got an extra down to go pick up that yard or two. So he, Mike Elko, smart guy. Again, Ivy League guy, Princeton guy, very intelligent guy, very confident guy. But again, in a Mike Elko defense, expect a lot of simulated pressures, zone blitz. Um, then from a personnel standpoint, it always concerns you when you bring in that many additions from the portal. It just does. It's not Texas A&M's fault. I don't blame them. This would be happening anywhere. But especially in a first-year program with a new head coach where a lot of these guys – it would just be so easy to, quote, unquote, let go of the rope if things get bad. Say they lose to Notre Dame, lose to Florida. They're sitting there, what, one and two? I don't know, we're about to pull up the schedule again. Something like one and two, something like that. How do those transfers kind of hold on? Big? What does Texas a and mean to those guys that haven't been there that long? That's what I mean, especially in a first-year program. You have to have strong assistant coaches to manage those type of personalities in today's game. Um, when you go this portal-heavy, people – have a certain level of expectation of how much they should be playing or maybe how much they should be getting. So managing those personalities will be key. But with that being said, what is a realistic expectation for Texas A&M in 2024? It's what the video is about. It's what this preview is about. First, the schedule, and like I mentioned, this is a relatively speaking, a manageable schedule. I'm going to pull it up again for you. Pull it up. Going back up the top again, I think you got seven. I mean, I think right now you got one, two, three, four, five wins. And again, I think you got seven toss ups with five of them being at home. I mean, let's just say loss, win, 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 win. You're four and one with Missouri coming in. Let's go five and one off, six and one. Say you lose to LSU, six and two. You drop another one. I mean, again, I know everybody's like, they should definitely win eight, nine games. You got to adjust your expectations a little bit because it's a first year coach. I know he's been there and I like the familiarity. I brought it up as something I'm fired up about and excited about for Texas A&M, but there's still some policies, procedures that believe me, Mike Elko would get frustrated with Jimbo about that. He's definitely going to change that may take some adjustment. And again, you see every coach in his first year have some struggles and lose some games. Maybe they shouldn't. I mean, look at Kirby Smart lost to Vanderbilt his first year. It's well-documented. Nick Saban lost to ULM his first year. Dabo Sweeney never really had a, had went, I think, 7-5 and five his first year. Off the top of my head, don't quote me on that. But, again, a lot of great coaches kind of got off to some rough starts at times. Had some games they probably shouldn't have lost in their first year. Um, and they got New Mexico State. I offered that win. And I just – right now, I don't see wins at Auburn and Texas at home right now. Call me crazy. Call me crazy. Call me crazy on that one. But just want to go through the schedule one more time for you before we kind of just hammer this home and get you out of here. Um but again, this this does look like it. We there were times just within this program, just the lack of attention to detail in Jimbo Fisher's program. And my last kind of point here before I let you go is what does it look like week to week in these 12 games? And there's two bye weeks this year. How prepared do they look each week with under this first year under Mike Elko? I said, because again, there are times the lack of attention to detail within Jimbo Fisher's program would rear its ugly head on those 12 Saturdays each year. But look, you're going to lose football games at this level, and a realistic person, fan, can understand that. But committing a bunch of penalties, looking completely unprepared in road games and trying to fit square pegs in round holes consistently, that just wears on people. Just wears on people. Looks undisciplined. But wins be damned, A&M fans will appreciate a well-prepared, organized team on a weekly basis, even if they don't come out on top in every game this upcoming fall. I think getting nine wins – will satisfy this fan base, in my opinion. But even if they just miss that more and look prepared for the first time in three seasons, I think eight wins will go a long way for the Texas A&M faithful. Is I think for the first time they will have a genuine optimi optimistic outlook heading into probably their next season in 2025. If Mike Elko can look organized, they're not getting beat because they have like 15 penalties in a game or they turn the football over. Had some pre-snap penalties, which shows discipline. I think if they 
Don't do those things. Look prepared. Look organized. Win eight games. I, th- I think you're fired up by that. Nine, you're dancing in the streets. Because, again, I don't like your chances in those last two. Just where Auburn fits in at the schedule, right, before your biggest, again, biggest game in program history, not history, in the last probably 11, 12 years with that home game against Texas. So, again, I think realistically, Texas A&M fans should be looking at how the product looks on the field this year. It's his first year. There's familiarity, but there's going to be some adjustments. I think eight wins would be a solid year if they come out looking good, not beating themselves on a regular basis. Nine, you're phenomenal, and obviously above that, SEC Coach of the Year potential. But, again, make sure you like and subscribe us on YouTube. Follow me on Twitter, at Mock10Sports, breaking down plenty of teams across football. Remember, this is – the CFB, CFBpod.com, remember, college football all to, all the time, all offseason. Obviously, when we get into the season, we're going to have everything rocking and rolling for you. Again, I'm Dave Shoemate, and I look forward to seeing you next time.